to everything we've talked about and so uh, you know the deviation what's the deviation that causes it all all the problems lust right and uh, there's a there is a Christian answer for lust uh, one of them is confessing your lust what's the other practical one marriage and it's the what use of marriage the Kind of like uses of the law, but it's the second use of marriage, right? The first one is the reality of the intimacy and everything. There's a there's a sanctity of marriage, and we, because there's a sanctity of marriage, there's a sanctity of sex, and at the same time, because of our sinful flesh. And so you, you look at you're always looking for the fall, what God intended, and it is does exist within a marriage, um, the intimacy and everything, and all the blessings that the two of them go together, and they're exclusive, mutually exclusive. The uh, sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of sex is mutually exclusive. They belong together. They don't belong outside of there. And it's a beautiful, intimate thing. And of course, it procreates. Uh, but then the second use, lust. So Christians say, as Paul did, um, it's better to marriage than to burn with lust. So uh, your spouse is supposed to take care of that. And so there's a second use in regards to the burning, and that's what Paul was saying. Paul burning lust. It, it happens to every, every individual. It's our breaking of the sixth commandment. Right? Now, that's where we put it, right? In this world where there is an economy. Okay. Right? What I mean by that is every aspect of, of our economy, when I think about economy, I'm thinking about how we go about living is compromised, but still it works, right? Uh, in order to buy a loaf of bread, you need what? Money. In order to get money, you need to? Work. And there you go. And so, um, if you wanna give me a free uh, loaf of bread, because you like me, and I take that as a gift, that's a wonderful thing. But that's not the, what really it runs our economy, does it? Uh, because of the fall, there is a, you know, well, it's right there. Now that you've sinned, um, Adam, you're gonna have to what? Work by the sweat of your brow, you're gonna have to plant, and not only plant, it's not the garden anymore. You have to plow, you're gonna have weeds. We work, so there's an economic system. And so there's a system for us. And unfortunately, part of that is the second use of marriage, right? And so what we said is that that second use of marriage that we as Christians do, we do that to attempt to curb the lusts in this, whatever length of time we live together as married couples, that isn't how other people define it, right? In other words, um, uh, I have to satisfy my lust by my spouse. And that's where it's supposed to what? Stay. The world is gonna say what? Oh, you can satisfy your lusts in various ways. And you can actually see, very interesting if you look at different societies, and I've looked at different societies, pagan societies as well, there's always this recognition that there needs to be marriage. And quite often there's, there's a lot of serious penalties, more serious than ours, against adultery in non-Christian or non-Judeo-Christian societies. They exist out there, but they're still all kinds of fornications that are allowed too. Very interesting to read it. Uh, but there is this sense of there, there needs to be, but at the same time, we've studied a little bit, we're gonna go into it again, but the whole pagan thing about how people satisfy their lusts and how it's attached to their religiosity, right? And how all that stuff goes on with, with the, with the uh, Shura poles and the holy places. And so 
The world is always going to suggest that you satisfy your lust outside of marriage. Or maybe put it this way, marriage fine, but also outside of marriage or in various different ways. And that's where we get all of this stuff, okay? And uh, we talked last time about the sexual revolution of the 60s. We're gonna go back to it again, but remember what we, we said about the sexual revolution of the 60s where all of a sudden, it kind of co coincides with the birth control pill, where we move from, you know, different plans of birth control, you know, it might give you a 50%, 60, 80, whatever, when the birth control comes about and the 60s revolution comes about, now we have what we, th we think is freedom, especially for the woman, because she's got a 99% chance of making sure she doesn't get pregnant, if she happens to be okay with abortion, now you got a 100% chance to take care of the situation, right? Uh, and now you have sexual freedom and you're, you, you are taking sex away from the procreation part. And that's a big problem that we have. I think you look at all kinds of studies and they're all saying that there's a sexual revolution of the 60s with birth control pill. And I'm not advocating um, a, a position by saying this, but it's just a reality that people then took that and said, you know, free sex, it's free, and you know, took it outside of marriage, so you can satisfy your lusts in various ways. And by the way, now the woman is free because she doesn't have to get one; she doesn't have to have a fear of pregnancy anymore. Okay. And one of the big areas, and this is the one area where a lot of people will say, oh. It's not that big of a deal, but I would suggest to you, it all started with the cohabitation outside of marriage amongst heterosexual couples. Now, homosexuality has always been there and all that stuff, but that happened really, I'm gonna give you some statistics of what, what has happened, how, where we've come from since the 50s and the beginning of the 60s in our outlook or our opinions on cohabitating outside of marriage. All right, but um, you know, if, if you were to uh, come up to me and say, well, yeah, we've been co cohabitating. Well, why are you cohabitating? There are certain reasons why people cohabitate outside of marriage, and I'm gonna compare them and show that it really does end up becoming lust. And, you know, and not having to necessarily uh, have the responsibilities that you're supposed to have towards it towards your marriage, okay? So we're gonna look into that. We're gonna, we're gonna go back to uh, our Jordan Peterson. He's got a half an hour, a brilliant half hour. And yeah, it's gonna sound really Christian. We had a little discussion here. This guy, now understand, this is, this is why I'm bringing Jordan Peterson and not, not only because he's, he's such, he's so elegant in his speak, speaking, he's so intelligent, but it just is so wonderful to watch him. <clears throat> Not that I don't want him to be a Christian, but I really enjoy the fact that he's coming to Christian conclusions without being a Christian, but he's just doing it by pure data and being honest with data and analyzing it, okay? We had a little uh, discussion here about, you know, why can't he see Christ and all that? Understand that a guy like Jordan Peterson began as an atheist. He still is, is absolutely, he, he actually attaches much of his study to evolution, so he believes in evolution, macroevolution. And a lot of his studies he'll talk about comparing us to the chimpanzees and things like that. And, and But we don't believe as a development. But even in that analysis that he makes when he attaches it to the evolution and the social evolution, the biological evolution, he comes up with conclusions that are accurate. All right, which is very interesting, very interesting to me. And that's why I wanna do that with you to show this. Not that I'm advocating, you know, if you know me at all, I'm a young earth uh, creationist who believes in an Adam and Eve, and just like the Bible says, literally, because it's historic, I don't believe in the macro evolution idea, and I hope you don't either. But it's just fascinating that he comes to these conclusions, and so we're gonna listen to him too. So. Um, I would suggest now that the uh, lust now in a environment where, and I'm gonna keep bringing this up, the woman is now free and the feminism is gonna start moving in a direction that's gonna hurt the female. 
I hope to show that. So, Christians at Emmanuel um, all the time. When I first got to Emmanuel, fresh out of seminary, half of the people that came to me for me to marry them were already cohabitating. And it blew my mind. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, ready for that. We brought it down. Now it's maybe 25, 30%, but it's still kids that I taught. They're sitting right where you're at because this is where I have them. And I say, don't do it because it's gonna hurt you. Don't do it, don't do it. And what's interesting to me is some knows that Pastor Stecker doesn't like it, so they won't come to me. Others will come to me and say, we wanna get married. All right, where are you living? Or same address, have to ask the question. Okay. Go, do you remember catechism class? Do you remember what I told you? And you get this deer in the headlight look to the point where I realize that the culture totally overshadowed everything I said to them about this subject. And then I wonder about all the rest of the subjects because, you know, there's no, there's no shame. And then I say, let's talk. We need to do this right. And sometimes it works. And I have some stories that I could tell you about couples. One in particular, I can never give names, but it was about 20 years ago or so where they come to me and they say, thank you for, for, for making this happen. And these are good Christian people, very good Christian people that were, you know, by the culture, they decided to habitate and they cohabitated for a long, pretty, yeah, for a significant long period of time. Um, you know, those are the ones that keep me going because uh, they said that they're, because they see it now from, from the perspective that I'm trying to teach you guys and I really would like our youth to understand uh, their, their, their relationship clicked and they saw each other and they honored each other and respect each other so much more when they got that. So I'm always telling people if they're cohabitating, we can do this, we can make it right. The sad thing is there are those couples that don't want to and, and then they've got parents that actually come get involved where they're all fighting me and saying, let it go. Let it, you know, it's, it's the way of the world. This is the way it works now. And I would, part of me would like to say, okay, let's do that so I don't have to rub you the wrong way or what have you, but Peterson's gonna tell you the same thing from a non-Christian perspective. And then you, you got the Bible telling you the same thing and we've learned the sanctity of marriage, right? Connected to the sanctity of sex, right? And so we can't give in to this. And parents have to teach their kids because they're not. I'm not saying you didn't or are not, but the parents, we got, the, we got to teach the parents because they're getting at me. And that's why I said, okay, so I guess you didn't teach this at home, all right? And I don't want to offend anybody here, and I don't, you know, but, but we have to do that. We have to go against this tide because believe me, I'll give it to you right now, 78%, we'll get to it in a second, but remember 78%, that's where we're at right now. Let's follow the world's advice and cohabitate first because it seems harmless, doesn't it? It seems harmless. You know Pastor Zexer's uh, sermon this last Sunday, if you were at the traditional service, and he talked about words and actions, and if your actions don't meet with your words, that's right on with this subject. And uh, we're, we're, we're telling our partner something and we're not saying it with words, we're saying it with our actions when we cohabitate before we're married, okay? We must speak in terms of covenant. Um, what is a covenant in the Bible? A covenant is agreement or a promise made between two partners who are striving together toward a common goal. In the Bible, God makes covenants with Noah, Abraham, on and on, all the patriarchs, uh, and he makes a covenant with you. A covenant with you is the baptism covenant that God makes with you. Notice it's one way, right? God accepts you, forgives you through the merits of Jesus Christ. And that's not a partnership. It's not a contract between me and God. He has a covenant with you that goes one way. A marriage covenant is one in which the two partners promise, right? They make a promise. So it's almost as if 
you're two persons within the Trinity, you're not, but it's very interesting how this works out, that the two of you are making a covenant towards each other, and it's a promise to each other, all right? So, you know, I, David, in the presence of God and these witnesses, take you, Carla, to be my wife. She says, my husband, what are we doing here? In that moment in which we decide to pick a date and have a marriage, we come together and you bring your friends and family, and you have the officiant, which is a pastor usually. And what do we do? We are declaring it before God, all right? And we declare it before the witnesses, our family, all right? So the, to where the family sees this, and there's kind of a responsibility for family to hold up this marriage, you know, in, in one sense, we have to do that. It happens in time to determine the point at which it is made, it happens in time to determine before the moment the covenant did not exist. So in other words, what am I saying is what we do something called the marriage service, service in which the promises are made and that's the moment. So there was a before and there was an after. It's black and white. There's no in between. And that's really important. Okay? Because just like your baptism, there was a moment in time that the water was placed on your head and the pastor said, you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There was a moment in time where Jesus took his last breath. There was a moment in time where Jesus was resurrected from the dead. There was a moment in time where Paul lost his eyesight because of the sight of Christ and now he had to, there's a moment in time and space for everybody, even the things and especially the things that have eternal significance. And it's true for marriage. We can't lose that. And of course, cohabitating causes us to lose that. All right? Think of the significance and honor and respect the bride and the groom are communicating to each other at that time. They don't, they haven't only said, I love you. All right? But the whole idea of marriage was, yes, I love you in my words, and I will respect you and I will respect God's gift of marriage to you. I'm going to treat you like an eternal being and a gift from God. And that whole respect and honor for each other is declared, and you have a history now. And you have a marriage certificate. Okay? To have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, richer for poor, sickness and health, love and to cherish, till death do us part, I am pledging you my faithfulness. All right, let's compare it to what is happening today. It's the let's shack, shack up and get it and get get to it later contract. It's not even a contract because there's no contract being made here. Different vows are communicated, not verbally. All right, don't don't read it yet. Don't read it yet. Look at me. <laughs> different different vows are communicated, not verbally, because those two are saying, "I love you, honey." Right? And and you, you make me feel great and all the same things. Um, one other part of that. May, it's maybe I, I want to live the rest of my life with you kind of thing. But it's the nonverbal thing that's being communicated. And it's basically this. I, David, without a covenant being made before God because of my laziness and disrespect, I'm a little sarcastic, but I'm not too sarcastic here. I, David, without a covenant being made before you because of my laziness and disrespect for you, want to slither into a relationship and live with you because it, uh, it is convenient and because you are not worth the wait to see if we are compatible, kind of like a used car, and see if you will make me happy. And I don't think God will mind because marriage is just a piece of paper and we don't need it to prove our love for each other. And that's the one I hear a lot. It's just a piece of paper. No, it's not. All right. Who thinks I'm being too hard here? I'm not. And even though there's a lot of words being said, there's a disrespect for each other here, okay? Men are not being masculine. 
All right, this one I would like to promote to guys. And I always, when I marry in couples, I like to try to promote the masculinity of a man and what he really is supposed to be doing in this relationship. But a man is not being masculine when he chooses to cohabitate before marriage. Women suffer the most because of their feminine and being mistreated. So if I'm getting into this arrangement with you and we're not, it's not under the marriage covenant and promise and respect, then um, if this doesn't work out, and by the way, I'm already telling you, I've got a way out if this doesn't work out because I'm not married to you. I'm not even legally bound to you. So even what the state would suggest I'm legally bound to, I don't have to, right? So who normally gets hurt? Well, they both do, but who, who usually is the one that gets hurt? It's the woman, especially if she gets pregnant. Okay. What does the woman want? What does a woman want from a man? Security. Security, protection. Remember we talked about that? So that she could be the mother. Right? You, and you, plenty of women here, tell me if I'm wrong. But it's nice, and I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm just speak. I always speak generally. I'm not thinking of any particular individual, but um, how many of you will, through, if it's, if you're older like myself, it happened way back then, but moms, women, raising children, knowing that you have a, a husband that's protecting and providing you for you. Is that the main thing? Yes, it is. Because the woman is the one who's putting it out in the sense that she's the one who's carrying the baby. She's the weaker vessel physically. All right. Remember how we promoted the feminine of the woman? What does the man want? What does the man do according to Luther and in his interpretation of the scriptures? The man is doing what? With his wife, his wife. He's coming home, who's at home? To his building, right? Luther said they wouldn't have buildings. Remember all that stuff? I'm coming home to my wife. You're coming home to your wife, the feminine. She is the nucleus of the family. She is the building. There's a centrality to that, right? Why are we messing this up? Why is one of them wrong? Why is it that women are so convinced now that they have to be and do the things a man has to do in order to be a legitimate human being? Why have we done that? Because our society is like that, and there are people my age there are, I, I'll never get any names, but I remember opening a door for a person, member of our church, and she got upset with me, and she said, I can do it myself. I was just trying to be a gentleman, okay? But I'm thinking, how, how, what's, what's wrong with that? Why, why do you have to take on the masculine in order to feel important? Can some women help me? I almost would like to have somebody disagreeing me with me right now. And you tell me. I, one reason I would say that you, you have more say in what, what you do with your life. And you don't have to have a parental approval or any family approval. Mm -hmm. You can make decisions on your own. Yeah, that's a good one. And this is why I beat up on the husbands a lot when I marry them, is because if you're a man and you're masculine, instead of the idea of coming home to your wife and being the stronger vessel in a different way as far as domin dominating them, right? A lot of men think the Christian, that means the Christian the father, the, the husband makes all the decisions and he becomes dominant over his wife, right? And those are the reasons why the feminine movement, in some ways, some of the connections, the reason why the feminist movement got started in the first place for good reason, all right? A lot of them had to do really with, uh, well, well, we'll get to that later. So yes, um, and go ahead. Another thing I would say <coughs> is that you look back, I, I grew up in the 1960s, mm -hmm. I remember that really well, but I wasn't aware of it at the time, but uh, in, your, in your passing years, I was there were a lot of women in relationships who were being abused yes. and they couldn't get out of them. Exactly. Because they, they, they couldn't hold, they didn't have education, they, yep. they had work, they had mm -hmm. all these things. So I guess that might be the kind of thing. Yes. 
two sons, one daughter, and I know, you know, Carl will say this about her father, I said the same thing to my daughter, get an education, be able to be able to live on your own. I, I, I think that's a good idea, a great idea, all of us should. And that's where the Christian, the false Christian understanding of masculinity comes in. And I think you're absolutely right. I wouldn't suggest that in the 50s and 40s and 30s or what have you, the families were in better shape completely, especially when the male thought he was the dominant of the two, right? And the idea, his idea of being a Christian man meant he was supposed to dominate his wife. Um, a good, healthy marriage is one in which they pretty much are in agreement on things, right? And they do negotiate things. And when we get to Ephesians 5, I'm going to show you that it really is the man that's supposed to be um, serving the wife in a way that they, they're not, they don't come across that way, or they don't even act that way. They uphold the wife. Yeah, I think you're right. I agree with you. Okay. How Anybody else? You, yes. How would you weigh, if you're raising your daughter and you say, you know, you need to be independent and you need to be able to take care of yourself, and you, how would you weigh that against raising her to these are the qualities you need to look for in me. Right. Which is more important? Do you put more emphasis on the fact that you need to be independent? Or do you put more emphasis on the fact that you need to, these are the qualities you need to look for in a man because you're not gonna fulfill yourself by being independent. Right. Of course, you're saying that to a daughter who hasn't gotten married yet. Mm -hmm. You know, you have fear that your daughter might marry a guy who's, who's not gonna treat her right may have lied to her along the way, right? So, um, I think that that's like, when you look at stuff like that, that's, it's almost it's almost a sad message that fathers have to give their daughters that message of like, you need to be careful because you're not gonna be able to rely on anybody. That would be scary, I think that'd be right. a scary thought for right. a, a girl. Right, well at the same time, I, w I was teaching my daughter, hopefully, that find a man with this kind of quality you know if you're dating him and he acts in this way or that way you know make sure he respects you and that's that's one of the parts where i try to tell people i told my daughter if the guy's trying to live with you or, or get in bed with you you know and, and on the second and third date the way they're doing right now drop him like a half potato i'm telling that to the seventh graders right now just drop him find a guy who has the quality who's who's willing to do the things that are, you should you should look for that kind of a man and I thank God my daughter found one like that, and he was, and he is a man that respects her, and did. I'll never forget when he came and asked for my daughter's hand in marriage, and he was shaking like a leaf, just like me. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, I'll go to prison. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I think there's different personalities. There's givers and there's takers, and to find partner that's um, not a taker but a giver and that has to be both people that are givers because otherwise uh, again you're going to have if your spouse is a taker you're going to be susceptible to we'll say uh, abuse in a way yes but, it, it is it would be so easy I mean, think about your relationships as husband and wife here. You know, it'd be so easy for me to, well, in one sense, yes, in another sense, no, it wouldn't. I'm just thinking about, I mean, how easy is it for a man to, to, to do that to his wife, to dominate his wife, to, to scare his wife because he's the stronger vessel? Uh, and then, well, that person is a weak man, too. I'll tell you what happens when, when I have, there's abuse in, in a relationship, all right? There's, let's say there's, and abuse can go both ways. A woman can abuse, especially verbally and such and such, but there's a pattern and I, it's, it's, it's four out of five times. So there's one out of five times it goes the other way. Who calls me when there's abuse? In a relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. It seems logical, doesn't it? Pastor, my husband is beating me. 
what do I do? And that does happen. I don't get a lot of beating me stuff, okay? So, but there is, there is a scenario that I see all the time, and it's the husband that calls me. Four out of five. One out of five, it's the wife, okay? Yeah, and, and you know what happens? It's this. Hello? I'm just going to make up names. Hey, Pastor, it's Mike. Hi, Mike. Susie's leaving me. Oh, man. Yeah, Susie's leaving me. She just said I had it, and she's, she's at her mother's house right now. She, she said, I don't want to talk to you. I'm divorcing you. That's it. I go, oh, man. Okay, well, let me call Susie. All right? Okay. Hurry. Yeah, okay. I'm out of control. Yes, you are. Okay. Hi, Susie. She's expecting this phone call, kind of. Hi, Pastor. I heard that you left... What's, what's his name? Mike. Mike. <laughs> uh, what's his face? Yep. And, and, he, and, 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 and she'll be like this. I'm done, Pastor. I go, can you come in and talk to me? I don't want to. I'm done. I tried. I tried. I tried. I tried. I'm done. They always come to me. At, they never come to me when there's, it's always when it's over. I'm done. And I'll say, okay, I can't take it anymore. How about if we make this deal, but I'll say, I don't want you to go back to the way it was, but what if we can fix it so that in the future it can be different? It's not going to be different, Pastor. Can we try it once? Because you, you're going to divorce them, right? Yep. So how about if you gave me a shot, and then if it doesn't work, then I, I guess you're going to divorce them. That's how it works. Now, what has happened in that relationship? Because when they come in to see me, what does the husband want me to do? Fix it. He wants me to fix her. Because he has an idea in his head, and he thinks it's a Christian idea, that he's the head of the home. See? And to be the head of the home is to be the head of the home and make all the decisions. And, you know, remember the, uh, the old, how come the Rolling Stones gets, get, gets, gets away with that song, Under My Thumb? Yeah, yeah the girl. Yeah. He was under her thumb. And what happens is she's been trying to be the Christian woman, trying to be the Christian woman uh, until it, she reaches her boiling point and then, you know, that's it. Right, right. Okay, I'm not saying all of them are like that because they're not. And I'm not saying women are not. There's usually, when you get into it, there's usually, you know, falls on both sides. but. Guys are like that, and they're actually thinking they're being Christians. Well, we're going to get to Ephesians 5, okay? Hang with me, because when you read what Paul has to say about what marriage is and what true head of the home means, it's not that. So I appreciate your comment. I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, because women now, kind of what you were talking about when you said to your daughter, because women are so equal now to men because of the culture that women, women are, that's why have almost a 70 to 75 percent of divorces that happen in one or two are women divorcing men because they are set they are uh, they do have a source of income they don't have to right um, but now the idea that they can take care of themselves I right. think it's I think it's a exactly. great great idea because you don't know what you're gonna get into and you know if somebody if a woman wants to have a career we're not talking that a woman can have a career you understand that right I mean it's not you know it's, and they should be able to be self-sufficient. Um, but then when they get into the, uh, the matrimony, then something happens. The oneness of flesh happens, and if God would bless them, there comes a family out of it, okay? All right, good, thank you. Um, it is the action and not the words. This is really important. That's why uh, if you read, if you listen to Pastor Dexter, he's, it's great segue. Um, Talk is cheap sometimes, isn't it? Uh, it is the action of cohabitation in itself that already rejects the idea of covenant in marriage. It's the actions that you take, right? If you don't convey the promise within a covenant, you have a way out when times get tough. And you're already communicating, I'm checking you out, you're already doing it. I don't care how many times you say I love you or it's just a paper, 
Um, your actions speak louder than, your, than the words, and they get communicated. If you delay the promise within covenant, you are in your actions conveying the same thing. You're at definitely lessening the importance of the commitment of marriage, aren't you? Just by your actions of cohabitating? How can you not be? Even if you think you are conveying a commitment through your words. I love you, honey. That piece of paper doesn't matter. You're communicating something because everybody knows what marriage is. And everybody recognizes the marriage that is going good and we all wanna hopefully what? Have that kind of a relationship. Because guess what? Here's a study out there. And monogamous, monogamous heterosexual marriages are having the best sexual relationships. And they took surveys and there's reasons for that because it becomes the intimacy that God wants it to be as you know your spouse, as you grow with your spouse and you have an attitude towards sex that's different, okay? If I wanna cohabitate with you and not have a covenant, what am I saying about you and sex and your body and everything else? There is something powerful about someone who understands something biblically ordained and able to communicate its significance while being while while not being a Christian. So who am I going to introduce to you now? Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Are you ready? And see what he has to say. This is brilliant, okay? Oh, and by the way, the woman next to him is his wife. He, she just became a Catholic, by the way. So she's become Christian. So come on, I get Jordan. I want him to make those biblical connections that we talked about. Um, but I really love to watch his wife look at her with admiration. Check that out in this video, okay? All right. Can you please elaborate on why you advise against cohabitation before marriage? Well, so why would I advise against cohabitation before marriage? Well, the simple answer to that question is there's plenty of evidence that it's a bad idea. And, and I just mean factual evidence to, to begin with, although I think there are other reasons. Um, people who live together and then get married are more likely to get divorced, not less likely. And that's a really interesting fact because it flies in the face of what you might think of as a kind of pragmatic common sense, you know, because you might think, well, you don't buy a car without taking it out for a test drive. <laughs> right, and everyone laughs because that seems obvious, but then, you know, woman's not a car. <laughs> And, and neither is a man, and really, like seriously, really not an object. And so it isn't obvious at all that that metaphor applies, even though it's, at first shallow glance, it's, it seems obviously true. Well, but if it's obviously true, then you might say, well, why do people who live together, why are people who live together before they get married more likely to get divorced? And one possible answer to that is, well, people who are more likely to get divorced are the same people who are more likely to live together rather than to get married, and that's possible. It's very difficult to separate those two things out, but in some sense it doesn't matter. What the facts reveal is that if the goal is to learn what you need to learn so that you can decide who you should marry more effectively, or learn how to act if you do get married more effectively, and the goal is that your marriage will be better and last, then it doesn't work. And so, and that's a strange truth. And then you might ask yourself, well, why? Why doesn't it work? It's also the case, by the way, that the more sexual partners, the larger the number of sexual partners that someone has had before they get married, the more likely they are to get divorced as well. And that's also, 
It's also the, okay, the case, by the way, and this is also interesting. So I spent a lot of time studying criminal behavior in all sorts of different manifestations, some of it on the political front with regard to the behavior of people who committed terrible atrocities in the service of political belief, some of it on the, like the frontier of, of criminal sadism itself, I spent a lot of time studying the behavior of, of serial killers and, and mass torturers and people like that. But I also spent a lot of time as a research scientist looking at what psychiatrists and psychologists know as antisocial behavior. And antisocial behavior is the pattern of behavior that characterizes criminals. And it's, it usually makes itself manifest pretty early in life, perhaps as early as two years old, by the way. And it's, once it's established, it's extremely stable. It's, it's, it isn't obvious at all that psychologists or psychiatrists have learned anything about how to remediate antisocial behavior, so criminal behavior, or its precursors in childhood. Once it's there, that especially seems to be the case after about four years of age. Once it's there, it's unbelievably stable and resilient to and resistant to change. And it has a lot of different aspects, antisocial behavior. But one of the markers for antisocial behavior, delinquency, childhood conduct disorder, early onset criminality is early sexual behavior and, and multiple partners. And so, you know, you can take that for what it's worth. Why is that the case? You could speculate. Someone who's oriented in a criminal direction is more likely to take advantage of someone else for their own gratification. I think that's the basic commonality. I don't know that for sure because we don't know why these different symptoms of criminality, let's say, link together, apart from the fact that criminals are predators and the really pathological criminals are predatory parasites, and that's really what defines a psychopath, by the way, is a predatory, a psychopath is a predatory parasite. Um, the archetypal psychopath is a sadistic predatory parasite, so, the sadist takes delight in the pain of others, so positive pleasure in the pain of others. The predator uses others to their own advantage, and the parasite takes no responsibility for his or her own existence and manipulates or compels others to serve that goal. And so that's kind of an ugly combination of traits, and one of the core elements of that is early multiple partner promiscuity. And so that's, that's interesting. And that also might explain why more pre-marriage sexual partners increases the probability of divorce, is that it's a marker for the pattern of behavior that is characterized by the exploitation of others and is therefore more likely to be unsustainable over the medium to long run. So that's interesting. Then you can think about it, try to think about it metaphysically. I thought about this, or, or philosophically, I thought about what is it, what are you telling someone when you live with them? Okay, so I, I've talked to lots of people, women, who are cohabiting with men are generally not very happy about the fact that the relationship is not moving towards marriage. Now, I think the reason, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Women seem to suffer more emotionally as a consequence of sexual activity outside of a committed relationship. You can imagine why that is. 
women experience more negative emotion than men on average in general, but also women pay a much higher, <coughs> sex is much riskier for women than it is for men, obviously. Hopefully I don't have to explain why that is. So, and so women are often not, women who are cohabiting are often less than happy about that. And the men who I've talked to about that with, about their partner's displeasure with the current unstable nature of the relationship often say something like, well, we don't need a piece of paper to indicate our commitment to each other, which sounds all revolutionary and Che Guevara, but which is really a pretty pathetic bit of reasoning. First of all, for someone to say that means they think that what they just said convinces you that all marriage is is a piece of paper. And that's, that's a preposterously foolish argument. I mean, at minimum, in the typical marriage ceremony, you make a vow by whatever is holy to you, or at least in front of the state itself, and then in front of your community as you define it, that you're going to make a commitment to someone. And if you think that's nothing, then you're probably the sort of person that the person you asked to marry you should run away from. So, so that's pretty shallow. And then you might ask, well, why do you need to commit to your partner in front of your community and a higher authority, let's say, and the answer is, well, life is really, really difficult and you're gonna have a rough time with your partner, no matter how much you love them, because the two of you are different and you're different sexually and you're different temperamentally and so you're not going to see eye to eye all the time. And then horribly difficult things are going to come your way. And they're going to, the complexity of those difficult things is going to tempt you to pull apart. And exactly when pulling apart might be the worst possible thing for you. And maybe you need that vow before your community and God himself, let's say, or at least the state, and the vow that you've made to yourself and your partner and the vow that you've made publicly to all your friends to keep you together when the going gets rough. And you might say, well, you don't need that. And I would say, well, that's just because the going hasn't got rough enough for you yet because when it does get that rough, you'll bloody well know that you needed that. That's for sure. And that will definitely happen to you That will definitely happen to you if you marry someone because all the things that life can throw at you will be thrown at you in the course of a marriage. And so the vow and the community commitment, you don't just throw that away casually. And you certainly don't say, well, that's just a piece of paper. You know, what do I need a piece of paper to validate my love? It's like, your love's that great, is it? You're really that much of a saint that this person, they can just, you say you love them and oh man, they're just done. They're in bliss, they're in paradise for the rest of their life. They can just rely, you're never gonna waver now that you expressed your love. You're just gonna be there 100% of the time. You don't need anyone else to help you. You don't need a vow, you don't need any tradition. So your love is so pure and holy that that other person, they just rely on you from that second onward. No hesitation. It's like, yeah, right. That's just complete bloody rubbish. You can't even rely on yourself in relationship to yourself for that. So, okay, so next, what are you telling your partner? Well, as far as I can tell, if you live with someone, here's what you're saying to each other. You're the best I can manage at the moment. <laughs> and maybe the same applies to me for you. And uh, we both really don't want to take on any more responsibility than necessary. Plus, 
we both want to have the option of trading up if an opportunity comes along. And so why don't we just make do with this provisional arrangement while we cast our eye out into the broader world and see if we can fish something better in. And, you know, you can say I'm cynical about that, but I don't, I don't think I'm cynical about that. Because living together means something like, well, we're not permanently committed, and not permanently committed means, well, we're impermanently committed, and impermanently committed means we're looking for a better commitment, or, or perhaps to be alone, but forget that, because that's usually not true. Well, what kind of basis is that to have a relationship with someone? How are you going to found a relationship on that? Especially an intimate relationship. How is that going to work? It's like, you'll do for now. I, I don't think that's a very solid foundation to, to move forward. To, to allow you to move forward. And then it's indeterminate too. So, well, if you're just living together, do you have kids? Because that's a commitment, that's for sure. And that's a real commitment, or it better be. And it's going to be inevitably anyways. And so if there's ambiguity about your commitment to each other, there's going to be ambiguity about your plans for children. And that's a huge ambiguity in most relationships. And so that's not helpful. That just means neither of you know what the hell you're doing. And that provokes anxiety and uncertainty. And it, and it, it decreases hope because hope is experienced in relationship to a goal. And if the goal is ambiguous, maybe we'll have kids and maybe we'll not. Well, then there's no real hope there. And so that seems to be a pretty decent pathway to misery. So, and then the, the next issue is, and this is the final one that I'll discuss, is you're not married if you're living together. And so you might say, well, you're practicing being married. It's like, no, you're not. Why? Because it's not something you can simulate. So one of the things I learned from reading Carl Jung, Jung thought about marriage as a container, as, an alchem as a container for alchemical transformation, as a container that would produce a heat so intense that the base metal of your psyche could be transformed into something ideal. But it had to be a container that could take, could take heat, because it requires heat to transform. And you might say, well, how much heat does someone as base as you need to transform? And the answer might be, a lot of heat. I need a lot of heat and pressure before I'm going to change, before I'm going to become purified in any real sense. And so what's the heat and pressure? Here's what it is. You don't get to run away. You're stuck with that person. And they're stuck with you. And you made a vow. It's like, uh-oh, I'm stuck with you. Just like I'm stuck with me. And, 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 and the vow is exactly that, right? In, in some real sense, the vow is, I'm going to treat you like you're me. And you don't even like yourself very much, so that's a vicious vow. And so you might say, well, how desperate do you have to be when confronted by someone else to change your ways? And the answer might be, well, you have to be as desperate as being shackled to someone makes you. You know, one of the reasons that Tammy and I have gone along and are still together is because we both know that we're stuck with each other. And so, and so we decided quite a long time ago that we didn't want to have the same stupid fight every day for the next 40 years. And so, and that's like the definition of a bad marriage. It's like we have the same fight every day for 40 years. That's hell. And so the alternative is, now let's just have a bloody fight right here and now and see if we can sort out whatever the hell is so stupid about us that's keeping us in this dismal hell. And why? Well, because otherwise we're just stuck with this misery. And if you can walk away and if you can leave, which you can if you're not bound together, then you're not going to withstand the horrible process of 
heat and pressure that's required to make you transform, you'll just walk around that. You'll just look for an excuse. I mean, people look for an excuse not to do that anyways. And so part of the reason you get married is so you're desperate enough to change. And, and maybe that doesn't even work. So those are the reasons you, those are the reasons that, no, there's, there's one more, there's one more. <laughs> this is the next thing. It's, it's a necessary act of faith. And, you know, in our culture, because we're not very wise, we think that faith means, especially when it's, parodied as religious faith, we think faith means the willingness to suspend disbelief while swallowing a proposition that any fool would reject. That's often how the rationalist atheists view religious claims. Faith means the suspension of your rationality and the acceptance of an, an absurd claim. But that isn't what faith means. Not really. Faith is what makes movement into the unknown possible. And you need to move into the unknown because that's where you're moving. And because the unknown is unknown, because the future is unknown, you cannot step forward into the unknown without faith. It wouldn't be unknown if you knew it. If you knew it, it wouldn't require faith, but you don't know it, and so you step forward into the unknown future as a consequence of your faith in some principles. And if you love someone, if you fall in love with someone and you decide to marry them, you don't have the evidence at hand that that's the right person for you. What you have instead is the joint decision that come hell or high water, you're going to struggle forward together. And then you don't even know if that's the right decision. Because you're not going to know till you're, till you've been married, like your whole life. You're not going to have the data, and so you do have to throw yourself into the abyss to be married, just like you have to throw yourself into the abyss to be alive. You have to move forward in faith, and then you might say, well, how do you call the best out of yourself and out of your partner, that may be a partner that you're fortunate enough to love? And the answer might be by, by offering them the gift of faith and by saying, look, you know, flawed as we both are, if we commit to each other, we have the possibility of becoming more than we are. And I'd like to do that with you even though there's no evidence that it's going to work. And, but then you might think too, the more deeply you're committed to that faith, the more likely it is to work. And you can't find out what that commitment is without the commitment, and so you can't simulate it by living together. Because it's not real. It's not real until you make the commitment. And so, and then I would also say, well, what if you don't make the commitment? Well, then you're not committed. And, and you might say, well, why should I be committed? Well, what's the alternative? It's to be uncommitted. Well, are you free then? Or are you just nameless and hopeless and confused? And you admire people who are committed to something. You sort of wish yourself when, when you're feeling aimless and you feel that your life is meaningless, you, you might think, well, I really wish I was committed to something. Wouldn't it be nice to be committed to something? It's like, well, Commit to something then. And you say, well, I don't have the evidence. It's like, you don't commit because of the evidence. You commit because of faith. And there's foolish faith, you know. There's naive faith and there's blind faith. And I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about staking your life on something that might work. If you just, if, if God was willing, if the faith smiled on you and you put your whole soul into it. And that's what you do when you vow to stay faithful to someone. And you can't simulate that. It's just, it doesn't work. 
So there's like five reasons why it doesn't work. And me, I don't know if you find those reasons compelling or not, but I've thought about them a lot. And I, you know, maybe there's a part of me that wishes that isn't how life was and that you could just have a casual relationship with someone in, and then trade them in on someone better if they happen to come along. But I just don't believe that's, that's delusional to believe that at, at best. And it's like Machiavellian, Machiavellian, psychopathic and narcissistic and criminal at worst. And so, So my question is, as a redeemed progressive, uh, what is the key to empowering men? So what do you think of that? Is that good? I'm glad he remembered that last one, because I think that was the best one out of all of them. Uh, faith that you're going to step into. And that now as Christians, we could say that God has ordained this thing and God is going with us, right? So I think our faith is one in which we know that God is going to guide us and we have his holy word to guide us. And when we go through our hard times, you know, Christ is the center of our, our relationship and it's even better than that. But his whole idea, if you don't know the future, so you got to step out, right? How if he's not a Christian, I'll never know. Um, it's, it's a, it really amazes me. That's why I'm doing this, because uh, it's good for us to understand that, uh, what time is it? I, it's 8.04. 804, okay. Uh, what was it to say? I don't know. What, what do you think? Thoughts on that? stuck with you like I'm stuck with myself. I like that one. Because sometimes, you know, you go through life and let's say you're never married, you're always single, you are stuck with yourself. And I like that because what's our Christian idea of marriage? The two become one flesh. One flesh. And so his that idea is you're stuck with him like you're because you are one flesh and now the two of you have to get along together and and, and, uh, and, and uh, Make it work. Mm -hmm. My wife may cringe when I tell this story, but we go to a wedding. I, I offer the groom with some advice, and again, it goes to give her some takers in marriage, and that the happy wife is not a happy life because if the wife is always taking. You're always giving, you're not going to be happy. Okay? Just like if you're always taking and the wife is always giving, eventually she is not. Marriage is about compromise and about giving oneself to the other person. And, and that's what I, I tell groups is there has to be compromise. Yeah. Um. I agree with that. I think it even goes one more step, and that's the Ephesians 5 text, because I probably should do it now because I'm mentioning it all that time, but I believe, I personally believe, this will be a little segment, that as the masculine, you have a responsibility to make that happen, and if you do it the right way, your wife is gonna blossom. And um, it isn't equal, and it isn't equal for a reason. So I wanna, I wanna show you that, because I think Ephesians 5 is so powerful when and again, Ephesians 5 is what? Uh, commit to each other as unto the Lord. Submit to each other as unto the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands, mm -hmm. right? As the head of the home. Uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave herself up for it. And it has to do with that, but even something else. And he, you could, what's so interesting is you can take it back to what we've already learned about the masculine and the feminine and who we are as a husband and wife and how that works. But I will save it, but thank you for that, yes. Anybody else? Did you move that around? Yes. Okay. Adjusting. All right. Um, what the world's going on here? Hmm. 
So people think cohabitation is practice for marriage. Oh, this is a quote from Dr. Budzinski. Uh, Budzinski. Um, that was another one I was gonna do, but I, I, out of time I cut it, but I took his, my favorite quote from him. Uh, this man is a Christian. People think cohabitation is practice for marriage. It's more like practice for divorce <laughs> because it's practicing living without a commitment and pretending you have one. That's brilliant. Think about that. And, I, and, and, and the statistics uh, show that to be true because if you cohabitate your chances, uh, without correcting it, your chances uh, of marriage double. Uh, 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 your chances of make it in marriage double, of not make it in marriage double. Thank you, thank you. So before, here's it, this is interesting, before the sexual revolution, less than a half percent of couples cohabitated. So we're talking about the 50s, basically. Less than one half percent. Today, the majority of couples cohabitate before marriage. It's by far the majority. Anybody want to guess what 78% means from the Pew Research Center? Huh? I'm going to say yes, 78% of couples live with each other before getting married. No. Good guess. Uh, actually, it's probably pretty close, though. Huh? Is it divorce rate? No. Okay. It's uh, people right now between the age of 20 and 40. 78% of people between 20 and 40 today believe cohabitating outside of marriage is okay. It's less among Christians, but it's still pretty disturbing among Christians how many. I don't I forgot what that number was, but 78%. So basically eight out of ten people today are okay with cohabitation. Where in the 50s, one half percent of us were cohabitating before marriage. Well, that doesn't mean they weren't having sex outside of marriage, but just the whole idea of cohabitating before marriage, okay? Or just cohabitating knowing that your relationship is gonna, not gonna lead to marriage. Okay, so I wanted to go into John chapter four, and this will go in quickly. I'm gonna look at John four, and that's the, uh, is it obvious to you, based on what we've already researched in the scripture, that this is how God would want it, right? And why we make the covenant before we come together in the marriage. In John chapter 4, we have the, uh, where Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman, okay? This is a really interesting conversation. It says, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although... In fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, um, but his disciples. Well, I want to start. On, I'm sorry. Got to go to 15. Uh, all right. So Jesus talks about living water. He goes to the. He goes to a well, and the Samaritan woman, who you're not supposed to talk to, a, a male. Hebrew is not supposed to talk to a Samaritan woman. Number one, because she's a woman, and number two, because she's a Samaritan. She's a half-breed, and Samaritans and Hebrews hated each other. But of course, Jesus breaks those paradigms and talks to her, and talks to her about living water, all right? And uh, really talks about the eternal living water, starting with verse 13. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become springs of water um, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. Now watch what Jesus does. He says, uh, go call your husband and come back. Probably a good, good idea for us to get your husband in, involved in this, right? But also, he knows her. I have no husband, she replied. And now Jesus responds, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. All right. What do you, what you have just said is quite true. 
and then the next verse, uh, she's going to try to change the subject to talk about a prophet because he nailed her life. So he, she's had five husbands, and at this point, he is living together. Uh, how do you think Jesus is speaking to her? I think with compassion, but also with what? A reality about her life. And she would be a social outcast, even amongst the Samaritans. That's why, by the way, she's drawing water by herself. In those days, women don't go to the well by themselves. It's too dangerous. So they would come in packs. But she's a social outcast who has had five men, husbands, so divorced five times, and now she's living with a person. And Jesus is, with compassion, telling her what? That is what's wrong. Yeah, so he's making, there There you have actually a comparison, an actual comparison of living together and and Jesus made a distinction between marriage and living together. Okay, for those people who want extra information in regards to that. I don't know why this is happening. Bottom right. Where the volume is. Okay. And then hit to the left of the volume or hover there. This one? The, the left. Go one left. Oh, to here? Or the digital slideshow up thing. Is that teacher's hand? Yeah. I don't know why I keep, I keep, I keep, I keep creating new ones, so. Start slideshow? Yeah, do that. From start slide. Okay, there it goes. Hopefully, this will work. So, when a relationship works toward covenant, abstaining from sexual intercourse until after the marriage ceremony, the action of consummation communicates both the respect and high commitment of fidelity. Okay. It communicates the sanctity, again, the holiness of sex. It values the gift of sex and the exclusive intimacy both the husband and the wife desire. It is what God desires for us. Now, here's what I get when, um, and, and they will say this. I mean, you know, I will get the stare and, and, and realize, and if I get the dinner in the headlights look, especially from people that I have confirmed, which blows my mind, but they, they I'll, I say, we have to do this right. And um, I said, you guys are living together. If you remember confirmation class, I told you that that's not the way you want to do this, but we can make it right. We can do this right. All right. Um, so when you want to get married? Well, we want to get married next year in May because we want a spring, and a spring marriage is really important to us. Yeah. Okay. So it's June of the year before. That's eleven months from now. We want to do it right. I want you to do it right because I want you to have a wonderful marriage. Right? You want to do it right. What do you mean? Well, we can do this right, and one of the things you're going to have to do is separate. Okay. We'll we'll have a period of, of, of forgiveness, absolution, and what? And we will do it right. And when I'm with you guys, this is before we even do any pastoral care, when I'm with you guys, I'm gonna show you why this is so important throughout the whole thing. And there are those couples that do, but the, usually the deer in the headlights say, I go, you guys need to talk about this. They go, yes, we need to talk about this. Okay, talk about it and let me know. And I try to tell them, you know, I'm doing this because I love you and I want you to have a good marriage. And, and, and I'll say, what I'll say is, this is what God wants, right? Do you believe that this is what God wants? Okay. Some of those will not, will just, will just have the deer in the headlights, but, but many of them, thank God, will say, yes, pastor, I know that's how God wants it. And then comes the what? But, right? And this is what I get. I'm just telling you what I get. Well, first of all, there's a passion between the two of them, right? They usually don't bring that one up, but I already know that that's true because they're living together, right? Number two, financial concerns. 
we're fresh out of college, we don't have jobs, or he has a job and she doesn't, what have you, and financially, it just doesn't make sense for us to live in two different apartments. If we can live in one, we can cut our housing costs in half. So financially, it's what? We're better off. Three, we're gonna get married anyway. Anyhow, anyway. And this is where, of course, we wanna talk about what? The, the covenant and then the whole respect thing that goes with it. We're gonna get married anyhow, so let's have the ceremony a year from now. I, and one of my things is, hey, you guys wanna get married? We can get married right now. Oh, but I want the wonderful wedding. I want to wear the dress, I want the, and, and those kinds of things become more important. But we don't have to wait. I mean, I'm not, you don't have to, you can get married in, in a day. You can get the marriage license and, you know, but at the same time, you're gonna commit, commit to me with the pastoral care because I wanna, want you to understand why marriage and the covenant that you make is really important. Um, I have to get away from my parents is a big one. You know what, I can't live with my mom anymore. She's driving me nuts. And now that I've been by myself, I'm back from college, and I can't live with my parents anymore. Distance between partners. And bottom line, all of these is what? It's more convenient. Okay. And that's where I get the laziness. Remember that contract that said, I, it, it's lazy. It, it's lazy. So it's more economically feasible for me not to make my covenant to my wife or my wife to be what's more important that respect and weight. To, to communicate the right things about what I'm getting into and, and to show that or economical feasibility. You know, it should be a no brainer to us, but it's not. And that's sad. If this, what's the time? Okay. If this subpar attitude regarding the sanctity, again, the holiness of marriage does not change. Studies show that your chances of divorce are 50% than those who wait. Interesting, that's, and he mentioned that too. He sees those statistics too. This should not surprise us. As Christians, it shouldn't surprise us because this is not what God says how to do it. And I'm so surprised by the cultural influence in the church today regarding this. I am blown away, quite honestly. Blown away. You know, I, I, think, I think I have my kids, you know, and I have them in confirmation, and we, we, we study the, the Bible in the Old and New Testament. Both me and Pastor Zeksha are committed to teach them this, and then when they come back, the culture is just so, you know, what do you watch on television? There was a study that showed that very rarely we have sexual activity on television, the people are married, right? It's always, it's always the exciting non-married thing that's going on in there, and, and, and the culture really totally influences people to the point that they don't think they're doing anything wrong. This attitude can change, though. When you come to see me before the wedding, we can definitely fix this. It is the action, not necessarily words. So guess what? When you come to realize this and your partner is there, and I've seen this, this is when it's beautiful because I'll, I'll have couples where they were building at me and, and some of them it's, it's, it's um, yeah, pastor, yeah, it's like you can see the Holy Spirit moving because I'll hear. You know, Pastor, in, in my heart of hearts, I knew this is wrong, but you know, we did this and this. I go, okay, so you know it's wrong, right? Yes. What do we do? And they do it. And what they're now doing is they're communicating to each other, right? All of a sudden she's going, Pastor, I grew up this way. I know, I'm sorry, but I just didn't, okay. Um, you guys want to, yes, we love him, yes. I want to do it right. She's communicating something, he's communicating something back to her. And when they both say, yep, we're gonna do it, and they look at each other. You know, you know, I always give them an out. You can go and talk about this. Sometimes they look at each other. I remember one couple, they looked at each other and it's like, yes, I want to do it the right way. And there was the one couple that came back to me. This is my favorite one. It was a couple that was living together for years and they came and they were a great Christian couple right now. Beautiful marriage. This was, again, 20 years ago at least. They came back to me and thanked me for doing this. And, and they said, if I didn't do it, their relationship would not have lasted. It was very beautiful because they, you know, and they just, 
did it and it was a really good process. Those are the things I hang on to because there's a lot of bad news that happens. Quite often, they'll just go ahead and get married by somebody else. They know other people will marry them. And I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm trying to help them. Otherwise, even if not verbally communicated, cohabitation becomes the devaluing of the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of sex. We are led to believe that God is limiting sexual expression when in reality he is promoting its sanctity. Because that's where he put it in the first place. In a degradation, we forfeit sexuality as a sacred gift of God and we cheapen it, don't we? That's the point. And again, matrimony. I'm going to return to the motherhood. Okay. So, any questions about cohabitating? Yes. It's not exactly about cohabitating, but it's when you're trying to convince someone of the importance of marriage, they see that at least probably half of our society is okay with gay marriage. Right. Does that kind of dilute the message then? It does a little, because that same 20 to 40 year olds, Percentage I don't think is that high at 7, 8, but it's really high. Uh, our, our, our kids, talk to our kids, I dare you, between 20 and 40. There will be those who say no, I, but there's a lot, a lot of them in the Christian community are, they're okay with, with homosexual marriage because they have been influenced the same way. So, um, yes, there's a relationship with that. So I would wonder how, since that has been okay with a lot of people in recent years, how that has been. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you prove that? Yeah, I think, yeah. But at least it goes down to the acceptance of what biblically speaks of a man and a woman, again, within holy matrimony. Now that we have gay marriage as being legal, right? You know, then they have to, to try to get their arms around two men or two women. And is that, is that, is there, is there sanctity of marriage involved in that relationship? What are we saying as Christians? We're saying against the culture that sexual activity is very narrowly defined and where it belongs is something very, very narrow between a man and a woman who commits for the rest of their lives until one of them dies to be together. And that sexuality will only exist between the two of them. That's what we're saying. The world is so far from that. What are you going to do? Well, we have to stand for what's true and we have to stand for our kids and, and teach them that. Those of you who have kids, teach them that, tell them. Um, you know, the question is, uh, what, 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 well, what would happen, Pastor, if one of your kids did? I, I would not approve. And if they came to my house, they would not be able to be, stay in the same room and I wouldn't go to their home. And I would still say, I love you, I love you, I love you, but this is not the way. And I would say to the woman, if it was my son, I'd say, my son's not treating me like a woman, but he should. I would say that to her. <clears throat> right. Yes? Um, there's also like the older generation that are cohabitating This, well, marriage is a covenant. So. Well, I know, but it's like um, they're not going to get married in a church. Oh, like a destination no, marriage? No, no, It's because two two people want to get together and get married, but yet they don't want to do their finances together. Their finances want to stay. That's I have it in my class. I have okay. a lady All right. who's 62. Because they're older. Well, there is something to that because of inheritance and stuff like that, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Social security, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. know that she's. Married. Well, we do. You know, they're. Yeah. Um, but but I understand. I can understand that. Like, let's say, I died and Carla marries somebody else, and whatever we have, we're gonna we want to leave about our children to be designated, and then the other person. Yeah. Would, 
Yeah. And so those kinds of things you have yeah. to really flush out. I would still suggest that that couple share their checkbook and everything else too. What are the things right. that, they're, the top three reasons for divorce are what? Mm -hmm. One of them's finance, the other one's family of origin, the old mother-in-law, family of origin, <laughs> and the other one is sex. Those three are the big three. But she said that she couldn't get married in a Lutheran church. They wouldn't allow it. Because? Because of the financial thing? I don't know. I, you don't think so? That's what she said. She said it's a different... Hmm. There's got to be something more than that. Her to allow it. Yeah, ask her. It's got to be something more than that. I will say that our son falls between that 20 and 40 range. But one of his big things is a lot of this crazy that's going on, and it pertains to this, is what these kids don't aren't taught and don't understand is the old ways existed for a reason. Mm -hmm. But the problems were solved before the old kid or the kids saw what the problem was and why they do things the way we do it. Mm -hmm. So they think they're having some epiphany that now, oh, well, we don't need to do it that way because well, yeah, yeah. we can do this. Yes. And they don't realize that the old ways that it was done exist for a reason. Right. And, and the sexual revolution of the 60s was the epiphany. And it has not served us well at all, especially women. Well, there's so many videos that I've seen that I, I can only pick so many of them, but the, you know, the experts say that. It's true. It's the bottom line. We have enough statistics now to show that that's true. And you look at other things, and you and I can sit there and go, yep, the old ways existed for a reason. You know. Yeah. Well, tell, tell maybe we tell our kids, uh, well, no, we tell them it, it's, it's God ordained and all. Uh, but that part, that, that, uh, it's statistically proving that uh, heterosexual monogamous relationships are having the best time sexually than any of them. It's true. So that's because it's a gift, isn't it, from God? Yeah. Yes. I think one of the challenges too is there's a lot of young young people that don't have the example at home. That's they're coming yeah. from broken families, yeah. so they don't have a a couple, a married couple to emulate mm -hmm. right. or to set an example. That's huge. And I think yeah. more married couples need to take young couples under their wings and say, "This is the example," because they're coming from broken homes. That's a good they don't idea. Have that yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's absolutely, absolutely true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, it's 8.30, so let's pray. Thank you for your input. I appreciate that. Dear Father, again, we thank you for uh, your ways. They're not always our ways, but uh, I pray that you'll be with our church and uh, help me and Pastor Zexter and all of us to be able to communicate the importance of everything that we've been studying and learning knowing that your ways are what's best, and you designed marriage, and you made us sexual in order to enjoy and to procreate and to grow in intimacy with our spouses. I pray for all the spouses here, uh, wedding, wedded couples here, that you would enable us to do that, and also that uh, we can proclaim what the world doesn't want to hear, but do it in love uh, to promote the sanctity of what you have instituted. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.